Well, let me just open us up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the Lord's Day where we can come and worship and learn of you and fellowship with one another in the body of Christ. Father, we thank you for all of the ways that you've revealed yourself to us in the scripture. And as we study today, we pray that we would learn and that we would marvel at you and wonder about you and all the great things that you are and that you do for us. Lord, we pray that you would be with us this morning and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, it's good to see everybody. So I'm going to be continuing on in the Orthodox Baptist Catechism. Uh, we'll be looking at questions 25 and 26 this morning. These are, I'll be continuing a little bit where Nick left off last week. And to set a little bit of the context of the catechism, again, the catechism is a place of, it's a record of, uh, it's a document of, of teaching of this, about the scriptures, summarizing important things for us. Uh, we looked at before, uh, questions 20 and 21 were, what, what is the only true faith by which we are included in Christ and are saved? You might remember there are three aspects of that, knowledge of God's word Conviction, that is, we believe it and agree with it. And then secondly, of course, trust and relying on it. And the way it's phrased in the catechism is not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven. So it's a personal grasp that not only the rest of these people, but I truly have had my sins forgiven and been made forever right with God and have been granted salvation. So three important aspects of faith that we have to consider. Uh, then it went on to ask, what then must a Christian believe? And uh, it, this, at, this is the point where it introduces the Apostles' Creed. It says, everything God promises in the gospel summarized in the Apostles' Creed. And that's our point of departure for getting into the creed. Question 24 we looked at last week as well. Uh, this introduces what is called the Trinitary, Trinitarian Doctrine of the Apostles' Creed. So it says, how are these articles divided, that, that is the Apostles' Creed, into three parts? God the Father and our creation, that's number one. Number two, God the Son and our deliverance. And then number three, God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. So the Apostles' Creed groups um, the elements or the articles of it within these three categories. So um, I really like the way it does this. At one point, I, I, I thought maybe it, it gave the Holy Spirit less, uh, less um, impact than the Father and the Son. But in grouping it like this, you can see that even in this third category of our sanctification, the Holy Spirit is the one who, who created the, the church. Um, he puts us in communion with the saints now and all the time. He applies forgiveness of sin. So this is a great way of, of breaking it up. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, of course, you can see the threeness of this. And this is, this is the threeness that's very apparent in Scripture about God and uh, this is why an early church father, he applied this word threeness, and in Latin that word is trinitas, and that became, came to be known as the trinity. That's the way that God is. God is trinity. He has three members. Uh, these are some of their main roles, but by no means they are exclusive roles. Um, as we know, God the Son takes part in creation, so does the Holy Spirit, etc. But these are um, how these roles of the Trinity or their, their actions um, are developed in the Apostles' Creed. So let's consider more closely now the Trinity of God. So this is question 25. It's our beginning for today. Okay, question 24. I must have a slightly different uh, copy or... 
Okay, question 24, all right. Seeing that there is but one substance of God, why do you name these three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? So that's the question in this catechism, and it's offered to all of us as learners. Seeing that is, there is but one substance, why do you name these three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And the answer is because God has manifested himself in his word. That is, he's revealed himself um, by these three, um, as these three persons. It says, these three distinct persons are that one true everlasting God. Okay. So what we see here is, is a couple of terms that we should look at. First of all, it's substance. What is a substance? Well, we think of matter, right, or material, or stuff. So God doesn't, is not made out of stuff. Um, the substance it's talking about here is what makes him eternal God. This is the God, uh, God-like stuff or just what makes him deity. And that is shared among all the members of the Trinity. That is who God is in his character and in his divine qualities that we, um, that we see in Scripture. It also mentions in the, in the answer, God has manifested himself in his word that these three distinct persons. So the word here is persons. And again, in our normal lives, we think of persons as people, like all of you people out there. I see about, you know, 40 different persons out there. Um, the persons here was a term that was developed to yeah, come to some kind of a grasp who the members of the Trinity are. They are personal uh, they are distinct, and that's another key part of this. So God shares um, within the members of the Trinity one eternal essence or being of God, but it's in three distinct persons. So that, that is very important. We should say that the, definitely the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Those are distinct persons, but there is one God. Um, who is named by these three persons of the Trinity. Some basic New Testament texts which uh, show you the threeness of God in the Trinity are some of these right here. Of course, the first is the Great Commission. Um, every Christian should know who the Holy Spirit is um, and the Father and the Son because that's the baptism baptismal formula, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of, of the Holy Spirit, baptizing people in the name of God, the Trinity. Um, a verse from Titus, when the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not according to righteousness, that works of righteousness done by us, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The threeness. Ephesians, for through Christ we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. And then the final uh, blessing at the end of 2 Corinthians says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So the early believers um, under the apostles' teaching were always... Um, seeing these, this threeness of God. And there's much more teaching that I'll, I'll go through um, to really show that the, the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Father are all one God. Okay. First, I want to say a few things about the Trinity. This is a doctrine that, first of all, we need to understand, is it biblical? Um, unfortunately, there's been a tremendous amount of controversy about the Trinity. Uh, we hold this as a very important doctrine. This is fundamental to cr the Christian faith. Uh, but we're going to explore the proof that it's biblical um, in a, just a very small sketch. We cannot go through into, into this in immense detail. But um, be assured, this is fundamental Christianity. You cannot be a Christian and, uh, and disbelieve in the Holy Trinity. Um, 
At the same time, a lot of people struggle with this a little bit in terms of, you know, how can I understand this thing? How can I understand how three can be one, how one can be three? Um, is this something I can even make sense of? So that, that's another one. And I think for a lot of people, there's also this, under, this question of, you know, what does this really matter to me? You know, or why can't God just be God? What, what, why this, this is com- confusing? It doesn't mean that much to me, or I, I have a hard time putting this together. Well, I just ha- had a note here. Um, as I pointed out in the last scripture, all three of these persons of the Trinity are very active in our lives. And um, I just would like to read a portion of the book of John. So this is on... This is during the last night when Jesus was with his disciples, the night of the Lord's Supper, his last night before his death. And um, he, had to, he really wanted to t- tell his disciples some important teaching here. This is what he said. This is John chapter 14, verse 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the word, world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, he says. I will come to you. The Lord Jesus said, I will come to you. Um, He goes on to write, or he goes on to say, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, I will love him and manifest myself to him. Again, he goes on to say, if, uh, my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, verse 25, that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. So in this night of turmoil for the disciples, he gives, he gives a, a blessing of peace, and that peace comes from the, uh, the fact that he and his Father are one and that he will send the Spirit. The Father will send the Spirit with the Son, and he will not leave them as orphans, but he will come to them. So this teaching makes all the difference in our lives Um, Every believer, um, I pray, experiences the knowledge of God the Father in their everyday life as they pray to him through the Son and appreciating the work of Christ. And all of this is done through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is a fellowship of love, and that's very important. Um, Even before the world existed, the Trinity was one in love. The Father loves the Son. The Father and the Son were together in all eternity. And um, that means that there was no time before the Son existed. The God, God is our eternal Father. He is the eternal Father, Christ the eternal Son. Uh, point four, we shouldn't be surprised that God is incomprehensibly greater than we are. Um, that's maybe a, not an explanation of the Trinity. We can't explain the Trinity, but... We can appreciate it and worship and wonder and marvel at who God is. So the Trinity is very important to our lives, and we can uh, pray, as it said, we come to one Father through the access or through the Holy Spirit um, in the name of Christ. All right, so I'm going to just give a couple of uh, teachings here about the biblical case for the Trinity. Um, Case number one is monotheism, Uh, point number one. So God revealed himself to one nation, and in time, that nation, Israel, of course, they became strict monotheists, and that was in a world that did not know the one true God. You know of any ancient people groups that believed in one God? I I don't know of any. I believe archaeologists and historians have looked into this. Maybe a few individuals have had some, had got closer to understanding who God might be, but only to Israel God revealed himself. And that was a a great work of his gracious revelation 
and calling that people uh, the children of Abraham. Uh, that was uh, an am amazing blessing for the people of Israel as well as for us throughout all ages. And we can see in the scriptures the character of God um, very deeply. Uh, first of all, we have Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Deuteronomy 6.4, this is the famous Shema text. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema means hear. So this is the uh, statement of the charter of Israel, really. We know that the Lord our God and he is one. Uh, Isaiah 44.6, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Which is incidentally something that Jesus Christ um, says in the book of Revelation. Psalm 115, you can see that there's always been a conflict between the nations in Israel over this, over this uh, topic. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. The psalm goes on to say, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. You know what comes after that? You know, they have hands but cannot feel. They have eyes that cannot see. So... God reveals himself as one God, our true and eternal God, and all of his character attributes, his love, his justice, his kindness, his perfections are, are all seen in what the Old Testament and the New Testament actually um, tell us about God. God is one. That rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, good teacher, and Jesus said, of course, why call me good? There's only one good. God, and that's God alone. Okay, I also wanted to mention there are some Old Testament indicators of the Trinity, and these things are, we see in many interesting texts in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, the name of God, Elohim, is actually a plural. He reveals himself in the Old Testament as one God. That's even in the Shema, an interesting word that is used for him, Elohim. Genesis chapter 1, he says, let us make man in our own image. Um, Genesis 32, that's where it says that Jacob wrestles with a man. You've all know, you know that story. And he gets the name Israel, which means this man struggles and strives with God. And he said, I've seen God face to face. Uh, Joshua 5.13. Uh, and even in, in Isaiah 61, where it says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, we see the Holy Spirit mentioned many times in the Old Testament as the Spirit of the Lord. So it's not clearly taught in the Old Testament, but I, you can find it. Uh, the Jews were not aware of the existence of the Trinity fully. It required some further revelation, and that came through the perfect revelation of Jesus. And that's what we'll get to in our next, in our next uh, slide here. Well, the biblical case that the Son of God is indeed God and is truly God, true God of true God, is full uh, all over the New Testament. I had, I had to just kind of placard a few texts here at the bottom. It is, it is immense. The birth of Christ, where... The angel tells Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the one to be born of you will be called the Holy One, the Son of God. He came to save his people, his people from, his sin, from their sins. Jesus Christ, our Savior. At his baptism, when the God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit comes and alights on Jesus as a dove. The Holy Spirit anointed Christ for his ministry. The authority of Christ in his ministry is so uh, compelling. Um, he forgave sins. He commands nature. He heals diseases, raises the dead. And he also interpreted for the people the law perfectly. So he reveals himself as creator, as the lawgiver who tells the law, speaks the law, the uh, Lord of life. All authority is given to me, he says at, in the Great Commission. Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, of course, the claims of Christ in the book of John in particular, I am. 
He said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. What are some of the other names of Christ? The book of John. I am the good shepherd. Sorry? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. Yes. So we see that he takes on these names of, um, of just supreme authority. And you've probably all heard of the, fra- the famous trilemma. If Jesus is saying these kinds of things, he can, he can only be a few things. Either he's a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. And um, all of these things are, are stated by Christ. His resurrection and Thomas's confession, where Thomas was, uh, Jesus revealed himself to the doubting Thomas, uh, doubting Apostle Thomas, and Thomas says, "My Lord and my God." Much apostolic teaching about Christ. Again, I, I have scriptures down here. Um, in Revelation, he says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega." Many others. So the Christians always worshipped Jesus Christ. That's another aspect of. Other things. At the end of the book of the Luke, it says the disciples worshipped him. Um, Worship is only due to God himself. God will not give his glory to another, and yet Jesus shared his glory and said, um, Father, glorify me even uh, as with the glory that I had shared with you before the world began. So Christ is indeed eternal God, and the early Christians. Um, held to this truth, they worshiped Christ, and this became a very important part of the, of the uh, teaching about the Holy Trinity. Um, the Holy Spirit. I have an immense number of scriptures, not on this page, but all about the, the biblical case for the Holy Spirit being God himself. He's there in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit is mentioned many times in the Old Testament, as I said. Inspiration of the Scriptures from 2 Peter, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God's Word was God-breathed, and it was inspired, carried along by the Holy Spirit in the development of God's Word and how He spoke it to us. And there are just so many scriptures about the personality of the Holy Spirit and His deity. Um, sometimes people erroneously talk about the Holy Spirit with the pronoun it, and that's, that's really wrong. The, the Bible does not do that, and we see that He's personal. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, uh, Peter told Ananias and Sapphira, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Um, Many, many passages. The Holy Spirit teaches, he convicts of sin, he comforts, helps, and encourages us. He bears witness to Christ, he speaks, he renews, he regenerates us, and he gives us life. The Holy Spirit is indeed true God. So, um, there's a very strong biblical case to be made. Um, I think it's ultimately strong. I, again, I can't go into details. Much has been written about this. These things are indeed controverted, but the Holy Spirit or, or the Trinity is a very important uh, doctrine for us, as a, also as a safeguard for our faith. And I'll I'll show you something. Uh, I'll show you a couple of things here um, in a moment. But just to understand the Trinity, uh, this is difficult. I won't be able to get into the second point here. Our faith seeks understanding. When we believe in Christ, we believe and we worship Christ, we need to understand how his deity works with God's deity. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. And this happened over a few centuries in the church um, as the people, as the believers put together this doctrine. The doctrine is biblical. The enunciation that we see in the creeds was developed over some time. Um, A lot of people will claim that something like the Catholic Church invented the Trinity. That's completely false. 
these beliefs about God were always there from the entire New Testament. Some people will even come up with these uh, crazy kind of um, conspiracy theories that somehow the emperor created, the, created this because he got all the bishops together and, and tried to kind of get political unity. Completely, utterly false. Many times it's um, talked about nowadays. The Holy Spirit um, has shepherded us. Remember, Christ promised the Holy Spirit. He said, he will teach you all things. Those things are captured in the New Testament. God is working his word out to understand how, who God is. Um, a couple of things that I won't be able to cover is the ontological trinity and the economic trinity. Really, um, uh, uh, large, long words, but basically it means being and doing. Um, the, Holy, or the, the Trinity, uh, we can under, think about the Trinity even before the world began. So oftentimes we think about the roles of the Trinity in, in what they do with us and in the world. Uh, we can also consider what they were, how they were together before the world was made. I think we'll have more teaching on that in our, in our series here. Uh, we can worship the Trinity um, fully. We sing, I think, every week. I, I know we sing this every week. The Gloria Patri, glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Or, the, the, of course, the doxology. So we give, give him the praise. And again, the Trinity doctrine is a very important safeguard throughout history. So I'm not going to give you any, uh, any analogies of the Trinity, these physical analogies, I don't even want to talk about them. They don't, they don't work. They're not, in, they're not compelling. Uh, they, they don't give the true uh, glory to God. But I would like to uh, show you a little bit how, about how this doctrine safeguards us. So the triune God is one that we will be worshiping throughout all eternity. We will learn more and more about him and his greatness and his glory in, in life and in, especially in eternity to come to know him better. Um, but this doctrine is an important one because it, it shields us from many, many errors that have been uh, promulgated in the past. So people say there are many gods. People have always said that. People say there is no God. I'm sure there are millions and millions of people who would say both of these things. Well, clearly, these are simple statements uh, that's outside the bounds of the triune God. Someone may say God is not personal, or it's impossible for God to have a son. So the impersonal God is a figment of people's imagination that God is somehow so far out there that he is just so, uh, um, well, I, I, don't, I, I can't explain the doctrine. We are personal beings. We have our own personalities. It is... Um, Faulty and futile to think that God is not personal and somehow we emerge from that. How about it is impossible for, for God to have a son? Who says that? that, that that's the, this is the Muslim faith right here. Where they say it's impossible for God to have a son. It's unworthy to speak of that. And that, of course, is also outside of the bounds of the, tr of the Trinity. Other ones that came through history, the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force. So this downgrades the Holy Spirit to just being a force or a, a kind of a, the action of God. Or there was a time when the Son did not exist. This was, of course, the main Arian heresy that they believe that Jesus Christ was some kind of a God, but they said there was a time bef before which he didn't exist. Well, that would mean that God was not God the Father. Um, that, that takes glory away from him, that it's, it says that he's not true God. So God, the Son, is true God within the Trinity. The other one, Jesus Christ was not a God, but an angel, a type of God, or even an inspired man. Well, this one we see in modern-day liberalism and even, even Unitarianism, that he was only an inspired man or a man of God. An angel is the Jehovah's Witness belief. These things are all outside of the Trinity. And then finally, just a couple of other ones. The one on the bottom left there is called modalism, but it's also common today, actually, still, that there's one God who simply manifests himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, depending on the situation. There are no distinct persons. 
That's completely outside of the Trinitarian doctrine. And even uh, the Father and Son inhabit two physical bodies. Uh, the Son does inhabit a physical body, but not the Father. And in fact, there's also a heavenly mother. You recognize this one? Yeah, this is Mormonism today. So all of these things are erroneous and very, uh, very uh, well, I would say dangerous to a person's soul, deadly to a person's soul if, if they believe these things. So let's keep our eyes on the Holy Trinity and... Uh, Continue to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Distinct persons in one God of one substance are wonderful and majestic God in the Holy Trinity. Well, I'd also like to cover question 26, which Kim tells me is probably question 25 in your books. Okay. All right. Uh, well, th now we are going to look at the first part of the Apostles' Creed. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Well, this is the lengthy answer, and it's a beautiful one. I believe in the everlasting Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who made of nothing heaven and earth with all that are in them, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence. Two things here. This God I believe to be my God and Father for Christ's sake, and I therefore to trust in him and rely on him, and I do not doubt that he will provide all things necessary for my soul and my body. But whatever evils he sends on me in this troublesome life, he will turn out to my safety because both he is able to do it, being God Almighty, and willing to do it, being a bountiful Father. So, the book of Ephesians said all fatherhood takes its name from our heavenly father, father in heaven. Um, as human fathers, we do care for our, our children, but we fall short in two ways. We don't have the ability to do everything we can for our children. And oftentimes we don't know how to or we're not willing to do it. So God, as our father in heaven, is able to do it, and he's willing to do it. So, three themes here on God the Father. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Father of creation and providence, and the Father of his children by adoptions. Now, in the Old Testament, does it use the term God the Father? It does, actually, in a few places. God is called the father of his covenant people, Israel. Um, people do not call God their father in the Old Testament. This is only fully revealed in the New Testament. And that, of course, was in the life and in the teaching of Jesus, our Lord. So, as we've talked about, we have two distinct divine persons that are revealed in the New Testament. In the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and His Father. Christ has always existed. He didn't come to be at some point in the past. He has always been eternally begotten of the Father, and that's something that we'll talk about in, in, the, in later studies, I think. Uh, if He came to be at one point, then God is not eternal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ, the exact representation of his being, in John chapter 14, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Um, so don't get confused when he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, that he's equating himself with the Father. He's just saying that they share that same substance or essence of deity. If you see Christ, you see the Father. The book of Hebrews says he's the exact representation of his being. God's nature also is seen in the eternal Son. Because of this, um, this love that they have, uh, it says in 1 John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten God, who is at the Father's side, together with the Father throughout eternity. He has made him known. So. Um, if you want to think about what's more fundamental to God, his love or his power, 
He has both. They're both fundamental. But um, if, because God has always been in fellowship, Father and Son, that love is really bef- comes before the power that he had when he created. God didn't have to create anything. He had a fulfilling relationship within himself, Father and Son, before that. He didn't need us. You know, this really kind of explains why he's independent of us. I think we'll, we can marvel about this some more. Uh, God of creation, who made of nothing heaven and earth and all that is, is with them, or all that, is, all that are in them. Psalm 148 is a beautiful one. Uh, he's talking about the sun and the moon and all the stars. He says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded they were created. He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. So God spoke the world into existence. Uh, this idea of he created them out of nothing is very important. The out of the of nothing is this well-known Latin term ex nihilo, which means God's creation. Uh, there was nothing there before God, uh, nothing physical. Um, so this is really against materialism and a lot of other uh, philosophies. Materialism is, of course, the idea that matter and the laws of physics could somehow be infinite. Polytheism, dualism, and again, Mormonism, believe it or not, does not believe in this either. So all of these faiths or ideas look back in the past and they say somehow matter was co-eternal with God. And this really preaches against that. Um, It also means that God's freedom and independence is seen. He didn't need need these things. The word word there is aseity, by the way. It's a very, it's a theological word, but it means he, he just exists in and, of, uh, in and of himself, and he doesn't, he doesn't need anything else. So, um, you know, we read in scriptures, you know, God doesn't need a temple made by hands. Uh, he doesn't need us. But th- so that's part of this idea of he created out of nothing for his own glory and to um, demonstrate his love for his people. He's... This also means he's all-powerful, all-knowing, his sovereignty and his lordship. Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God. He is God. It is he who made us and we are his. So as God being our creator, he owns us, he commands us, he rules us. And also this shows his goodness and his greatness. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. God is good. And that's something that... All people see uh, deep down, Romans chapter 1, that uh, when it talks about from what's made, we see God's eternal power, his divine nature, and that he is good. We should all, not just us here, all people, all persons should thank God because he made them and he gave them life and he is good. So the father of creation and providence. I also want to talk about providence. We're going to get a lesson next week on on the providence of God from Jeff Whistler. I'm looking forward to that. Um, God's providence is seen in how he sustains everything. So even in the biggest things, he declares the ends from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Isaiah 46. And even in the tiniest things, and this is what Christ told his disciples, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. So God is providing for us. He's sustaining this world, this very majestic world. Sometimes people get incredibly pessimistic. I think from all these other philosophies, there's a a tremendous amount of pessimism in the world about And you know all the things, nuclear war, wars, and rumors of wars, and we have pessimism about the economy, pessimism about global warming, and all these things. God sustaining this world. Um, This is a sad world, no doubt, but God sustains it in his goodness. So God is, is the father of creation and providence. And for us, uh, he's our father by adoption. Not creation, 
Um, oftentimes, especially in liberalism, there's been a concept that all people are children of God. You might have heard that, you know, the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. Um, that's not a biblical term. I don't believe you should use that, um, except in maybe a very limited s- statement. Um, Christians are children of God by adoption, and that's because of Christ. We are in Christ. This is the wonderful uh, blessing and benefit of being in Christ is that we become children of God. Ephesians 1.5, in love, he pre- predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Going back to his eternal purpose for us to make us children of God. Romans 8.14, um, in the time we have remaining, I, I might have to curtail some of these scriptures, but this is a beautiful scripture about how those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We didn't receive the spirit of slavery, but we received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Um, the uh, London Baptist Confession has a wonderful uh, chapter on adoption, which actually contains just one paragraph. And it talks about all of the blessings that we receive by being children of God. Uh, so this goes on to say, therefore, we trust in him. This is our catechism. We rely on him. And that I do not doubt that he will provide all things necessary for my soul and body. Uh, then it says, whatever evils he sends on me in this troublesome life, he will turn out to my safety. We'll hear more about this again next week. I just want to point out, um, this has been translated or put in a different way, but this is actually very accurate scripturally. The evils he sends on us are not, um, are not uh, he's not the cause of those evils. We, we experience evils in life. He's not the immediate cause of them, but in his ordination of all things, he does uh, send trials on our lives. Troubles, they are, they are evil things. I'm looking forward, to, uh, again, to Jeff to explain this all to us better next week. But he's going to turn all these things out to my safety. Um, many times we need those evils in our lives. Why? Well, these are all things we receive from God, but what does a father also do? You get down here near the end of the list. Chastened by him as by a father. So that's the discipline of the Lord, and we receive God's discipline often by the difficulties he sends us. So, finally, the Father, able and willing. He is able to work in our lives, everything for our safety. He's willing to do that because he's our eternal Father. Let's give him thanks. Father, we thank you for the way that you've revealed yourself to us in your word, that you are our our heavenly Father, and we thank you for the blessings of adoption in Jesus Christ, your true Son. Father, we marvel and speak of you, and we want to praise you. Lord, we pray that you'd empower us this morning to worship you fully as we go upstairs. We thank you for the blessings of salvation in Christ. We thank you for the blessing of justification, forgiveness of of sins, and adoption into your family. And Father, we worship you. We thank you for your Son, and in his name we pray through the Holy Spirit. Amen.